Thank you so much for being here. Um, I appreciate everybody taking the time today to uh, join uh, Sky Solutions today with our uh, virtual event slash panel discussion. Uh, my name is Michael Hoke. I am our Director of Business Development and along with Leanne Christopher, our Platform Hello. Operations Lead, uh, we will be moderating today's discussion. Um, I will start off with a few things just about what this discussion is all about, a little bit about the company, and then um, I will turn things over to Leanne to uh, go into some of our specific uh, discussion points uh, today, uh, and we'll go from there. But, um, you know, uh, I, I have this question in my mind right now, you know, why, why are we here today? And um, a lot of what we do here at Sky, especially with our virtual events, really are inspired by things that are happening real time in the market, uh, discussions with our clients, things like that. And, you know, especially um, as of late, you know, we've, we've, we've had a lot of these um, situations where, you know, whether it's a, a technology leader, a program manager, a, a business leader, wh whoever it is, I mean, everyone's just really being inundated right now uh, with these requests to fix very specific business processes, specific business challenges. And from that point forward, there's, there's a lot to figure out, right? Um, you know, uh, what, what solutions do I look at? There's these things in the market like robotic process automation and machine learning and AI and all these things that, that could be applied to fix problems. And then there's all these platforms out there, business process management platforms, low code platforms. And um, in my mind, we're looking at things in terms of challenge, solution, platform. There's a whole string of events there that one really has to go through uh, to ultimately get to a solution where you're fixing something and seeing some ROI. So it's, it's, it's in that spirit that um, today's discussion topic, uh, topic kind of came about. And that's why we're talking about what we're talking about today. So um, just a few pieces of housekeeping. Um, uh, this is being recorded. So if anybody wants to review this again, if there's something you want to look at more closely, you'll have a copy of that. Um, I wanted to mention that we, we do have a very diverse group on the line today, which is always great. Uh, we have, uh, you know, practitioners up to C-level executives. We have people from the private sector and the public sector. Um, we also have folks from other partner agencies like Sky Solutions, uh, and we have some folks from some of the platform companies uh, that we represent out there today. So just a very nice, diverse cross-section of attendees today in the meeting, which, which, which is great. And I, I also think that speaks volumes to um, how pervasive these topics and platforms are uh, all, all across the market today, for sure. Um, lastly, uh, I, I, I like to remind everybody, and, and Chris, you kind of did a good job kicking that off already, but we, we do want this to be interactive. We're going to be talking through some things, presenting some things, uh, but you're going to see our practice leads on the screen. And, you know, if you have a specific question about any of the solution areas we're covering, you know, robotics process automation, machine learning, AI, low code development, or anything specific to the platforms that we represent that uh, our platform practices are built around like Pega, Appian, uh, ServiceNow and others that you're gonna hear about today. Um, this is your chance to interact directly with some of our practice leads. So, you know, raise your hand, ask questions, challenge us. Uh, we'd love to engage that way um, as often as possible throughout this. Um, and last but not least, um, we, we do like to keep this, you know, light and fun. I know most of us are still at home working and sometimes this can be a nice little uh, respite from the, the work day. So um, we'll, we'll try to keep this as fun and interactive as possible. So uh, with that, um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide and we'll continue to move forward. Wonderful. So just, just a quick outline of uh, today's agenda. Um, in just a minute, I'll give you just some brief introductions to some of our speakers today. Um, and um, a quick introduction to Sky Solutions. I don't want to spend a ton of time on that, but do want to give you all just a little bit of background and context as to who we are and why we're covering these topics today. And then I will turn it over to Leanne to um, go through a couple of survey questions just to get some feedback from the audience and um, you know, get a few bits of information from you all to see which direction we want to go in. And then for the bulk of our time today, we will be going into some of our discussion topics. We'll start off with uh, just talking about platform evaluations in general. Then we'll go into some specific use cases, uh, which our practice leads will, will cover in detail. And uh, then at the very end, we'll talk a little bit about how um, we are helping uh, organizations uh, with some of these things. And then we'll have some time for, for Q&A and we'll wrap things up. So uh, next, please. Wonderful, wonderful. So um, um, we are built around, um, as, as I said, some of today's leading platforms and we have some, some, some very smart people uh, in, in the uh, session today, uh, Dris Salami, uh, who is our PEGA expert and, uh, and practice lead, uh, Angel Reyes, who is our Appian practice lead, and Joey Panay, who is our ServiceNow practice lead. We also have some folks on the line from our cloud services practice leads and 
um, a, a couple of our other practices, um, which we'll get to in a minute, but uh, just wanted to give you a look at uh, some of our primary speakers. Uh, next, please. So just a little bit about Sky. If, if you look up at the very top in bold, um, we are a digital transformation company. What does that mean? It's a big word. Um, I like to think that what we really focus in on here at Sky Solution are complex business process challenge, solving business complexity specific to business process challenge. Everything we do, the way the company is built, it really comes down to that. And um, that's our focus every day. Uh, if you look at the underlying sectors, those are our primary areas of focus. So we do a lot of work in the public sector, but also on the private side, uh, in the healthcare sector, a lot of uh, healthcare payers, things like that. And then certainly uh, financial services, uh, banks, uh, you know, lending institutions, um, every, everything and anything that can be in the financial sector, we're doing a lot there. Um, in the middle, we tend to categorize um, our offerings into two areas. On the left side are strategic solutions. This would be the area we, we engage in where folks are, are looking at, at platforms. You know, what, what do we do? Where do we go? Which direction do we go in? Can you provide us a roadmap? Give us some guidance. Can you help us with an analysis of alternatives? Can we look at a few POCs to test some of these ideas to make sure we know we're going in the right direction? So um, true um, you know, consultative advisory on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, um, is really where our, our hands-on technical expertise comes into play. So the actual low-code, no-code development that's happening on all the platforms that we serve, um, you know, uh, the robotics process automation that we're implementing through all the platforms. So the true hands-on, you know, building and experience on the tech side will be over there on the right-hand side. Uh, on the very bottom, I don't want to go through all these, but on the bottom left for our federal folks on the, on the line, you'll, you'll find uh, relevant the fact that we're an SBA 8A certified company. We're on GSA Schedule 70. We have uh, all of our ISO certifications. In the very middle, um, you will also see that um, our primary, most mature practices do happen to be PEGA, Appian, and ServiceNow. But uh, we are partners with the other companies you see there, such as uh, Comunda and Salesforce. Uh, Azure and AWS uh, would make up our cloud services practice, and we're continuing to develop and mature those practices as well um, along the same lines as the focal points I mentioned above. So uh, we can go ahead and move on from this. And lastly, about us, just a quick snapshot of some of our clients. Uh, I'm sure you'll see um, some private companies and some federal agencies in here that, that you recognize. If, if, if there's any um, company or agency in here that you want to learn more about in terms of what we've done for them, what we're doing, happy to give you those details. Um, and I just think this, this is indicative, again, of the fact that, um, you know, we come to the table with, with a wide breadth of experience in terms of the solutions that we provide. A lot of times the things that we are developing in the private sector are very applicable to the challenges that exist in the federal sector and sometimes vice versa. So um, um, back to the original point about business process challenges, um, we're fixing those things at all of these clients you see here. So uh, why don't we move ahead, please? So without further ado, I would love to introduce again, Leanne Christopher to kick off uh, the, uh, the next part of our, um, uh, our event today. I'll, I'll try to stay as involved as possible throughout to, to moderate and ask some other questions, but uh, Leanne, why don't you go ahead and take it from here? Great, thank you, Mike, appreciate it. Hi, my name's Leanne Christopher. I'm the Platform Operations Lead at Sky Solutions. To kick it off, it's really, really nice just to start with some survey questions, just kind of pull the audience on where things are and, and your thoughts. So if you could take a few moments and read this question with me, what are your top business challenges or IT priorities? Feel free, oh, we'll reset the question if that's possible. And then we will ask everyone and if we'll just pause for a moment. Oh, I guess it's going through, I'm sorry. It was so quick. Thank you for the fast responses. I already, it was jumping so quickly. So let me rephrase the question. Sorry about that. What are your top business challenges or IT priorities? Feel free to select a couple answers if you see more than one that fit. And great, as the results come in on this question, we can see it's an overwhelming modernized IT. And I know that that's always a large ask because it's like the how, the execution of it is a lot of the things we're gonna to uncover today. It'll easier said than done with just modernize IT because there's so, all aspects of project delivery are necessary there. So thanks for so many votes. 33 respondents, I appreciate that. With the top two being modernization of IT and reducing costs. Uh, be curious, for the, those of you that answered other, feel free to put those in the chat. I'd just love to see those and see if they're a little more on the technical side or where they fit in um, your thought process. Be great to know that insight. Okay. And let's move into question number two, please. And second question, it kind of follows in the suit of what Mike laid out for us and what we're going to cover today so well. 
which of these listed here are the top platform capabilities being incorporated into your solutions, your programs? We'd love to know and gauge where you've already had some experience. Great, and as the answers are coming in, low-code development and RPA, yeah, those are the typical right starting points, and um, it'd be great to see um, what, if the respondent that placed other could put in the chat, that would be, we'd be curious to know what, what uh, the capability you're thinking of there and um, how all this ties together. What's interesting in some of these results I also see now is that um, at this point, no one's responded with AI. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, we'll look at that together. Um, so our panelists, check out the chat as they come through. With AI not being answered, I, I kind of find that interesting because we're going to um, talk through where we see that fitting in just the um, capability landscape of adapting to a platform. And we'll talk through which platforms have this capability and um, how it kind of is a, uh, sets the groundwork for really advanced machine learning. So let's get into that a bit more today as well. So as we move to the next slide, any questions or thoughts from anyone, panelists or attendees, before we move into um, reviewing our results against industry standards? You can go back one slide, thank you. But I'll pause to ask. Any other thoughts or questions? Nope, okay. So comparing our results to industry standards of what we've found in preparation for this webinar and just knowing where industry trends lie. Uh, you hit the right, the top two right on the mark, modernizing IT and reducing costs. So we're going to break down some of those results with relatable use cases and how we have found value in working with our clients to show some of that success, both in near-term and long-term planning. Um, that's always the balance, that balance between reducing complexity and effort and cost and keeping up with the focus of demands with platform delivery. So let's pause. I don't want too many things to go by without asking. So anything that the panelists want to pick up on on those chats that we're seeing come through on these topics? Yeah, I will say that, for example, for uh, uh, Chris Medina, he mentioned about the, the, one of the reasons it would be to duplicate systems and lowering enterprise sustained time and cost. And yeah, we're going to talk about that right now in the low uh, code development platform. Um, I can see continually see the, the return of investment for of RPA um, for a specific scenario. I think Rajiv, we can we can uh, talk. I mean, it evolves more more in uh, uh, investigation in about the requirements in order to, to give you more information. So maybe after the the this webinar, we we are going to sync up with you on that. Um, Great, thank you, Angel. We have seen, um, you know, and, and specific use cases. There is a lot of ROI and RPA implementation, and um, not as much in specific types of use cases. So, um, you know, we would cover some of them as we go through. But you know, definitely, uh, we can give a lot more insight into types of use cases that we have seen significant ROI. And I think from my perspective, when it comes to eliminating duplicative leg legacy systems, um, it you see this a lot in organizations where they have a ton of systems that do the same things that you know you can utilize one platform for. And it comes to one of those situations where you have to kind of look at you know what you have in your organization and what, what you can start eliminating and putting into a single platform and just kind of standardize that. So that's one of those things, Chris, where we may have to look into it and you know kind of you know if you want to have a discussion, kind of see what what you have and how we can kind of mitigate that into a single platform if you want to start getting rid of some of those systems. Yeah, so I definitely agree. That's one of the that's one of the overarching concepts for our low code initiative um, to, to our knowledge and what we're trying to field. We're aware of about 430 disparate systems. And so we're trying to communicate to our leadership that we have this really excellent concept in in what low code has to offer right now within within our enterprise and you know if we can take 
430 different systems that are out there and we can put them under the umbrella of our initiative, you know, just think of the cost savings and the, the efficiency that we can end up providing to the operational end user. So there's, there's a, there's a stack within all of this. And, I, you know, I, I'm really glad you all put this out there because as we're just getting started, so many of the things that you've already addressed early on are some of the primary drivers to why we want to utilize low code within our enterprise. So um, yeah, thanks for, point, thanks for pointing those specific things out. Excellent, great, great you're here. So yeah, keep, um, keep your questions coming as we talk through this today. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move into our first topic and that's really around just the whole platform evaluation in general. Where to start, where you already are in flight, what to consider. So you can bring up the five things I've listed here, and this list could be 5,000 things, but we wanted to reduce it down to just some typical broad categories to get started. And as you are likely already on a platform or your organization is invested in multiple platforms, multiple applications enterprise-wide, starting point for our discussion is somewhere in between, managing all those multiple projects and programs, the costly efforts that are always encumbered with that, keeping your legacy systems running and trying to work off of them as you embark into new technologies, just figuring out what that right blend is. So within talking about requirements, uh, the necessary regulatory requirements are always things that control schedule. So workflow automation and reducing lag time are typically you know, the business value of where you can bring visibility to getting faster regulatory compliance constraints resolved. Um, in that, other projects, especially the more innovative ones, likely get delayed. So if solutioning all goes toward platform, that can rapidly improve regulation requirement needs and just have that optimal blend of being able to quickly implement things that improve day-to-day -day business, because that's our ultimate goal. In doing this, who is affected by it? It's the stakeholders. So we always first and foremost think about our IT stakeholders, all the people that keep the lights on, the application landscape, infrastructure teams, security teams, just to name a few. Their input criteria is vital. But now we're seeing, as we've all seen, business stakeholder involvement is key. And if you don't get it right for them, you've, you've missed the mark. So their influence and involvement, participating earlier in platform implementations as a business stakeholder, very important and we're going to spend some time talking about them today as well. Friendlier user interfaces help bridge this gap and business users actually doing some of that configuration through low code development, the citizen development concept with guided setups helps bridge that distribution of work. So I'd like to pause here and ask, um, has anyone on the phone today either been part of equipping, equipping a business user, guiding them to be part of implementation, or a business user directly being involved in low-code development? Feel free to raise your hand or respond in the chat. Yep, so I'm seeing an ERP answer. Yep, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, because we'd love to hear your insights either now or throughout the conversation of what your user experience has been. Because if anything, we'll take away some learning as well, like what worked well in your experience, what didn't work well. So the ongoing retrospective of how we can always just improve how we work with business stakeholders and our, our clients is, is our ultimate goal. Okay. And the other question I kind of was curious about is follow-up. Um, have any of you ever felt like you are, quote unquote, a citizen developer? Have you trained one or do you consider yourself one? If you could raise your hand if you, if you kind of fit that definition, we'd like to see that as well. Great, thank you. Several of you have re responded in that way. Yeah, so for our panelists, yeah, feel free to intertwine that into your conversation as we go through more use cases. But to wrap up the rest of these requirements, um, that kind of covers the user interface, accessibility needs, and then going into data management. That is an ever-growing challenge and the best way for continuous improvement with good, clean data and, and making sure that that's improved across platform usage. That consideration is also very important. Lastly, just for the five we're rounding out for today is those, those support costs. Uh, all things personnel related and licensing costs um, factor into those platform decisions and just figuring out what the most cost effective go to market solution is. Platforms range in pricing, whether it's um, sh freeware or, or open or enterprise licensing. There's a lot of options to consider and that's where Sky Solutions can come in. 
with our wide experience of our panel, uh, there's certainly things where we can bounce Q&A of best experiences with what type of platform needs um, you have and, and where you should likely start your journey. So I'll pause for a second before we leave the slide. Are there any other main requirements that you see as something that doesn't really fit into one of these broad categories? I do see there's a there's a nice question from Howard Pope. Uh, based yep. on the evaluation, what are the cases where having all three major platforms makes legitimate sense? Howard, can you please mention which three major platforms you are referring to? Are you mean RPA and BPM low code and, and AI or or the or Pega service now and Appian? Yeah, I think he's probably thinking the former, or sorry, the latter of what you're saying. Like, so if, especially if company, and I, we find too, like if agencies or organizations rather have through acquisition become larger and larger, there might be more than one platform that's running the business and how, if it makes sense to keep those platforms up and running or for a consolidation effort, I think is where that question is coming from on hill. Okay. Yeah, definitely. With, it, with uh, all these platforms, all, all, all these platforms, mo uh, most of them contains or have the same the same amount of functionality or, or the same functionality in one way or other. Uh, I will say that uh, it will depend on the requirements. There are some platforms which are which has created some uh, uh, libraries or shared components that it can easily or, or initiate uh, help to the initiation of the projects. So that's why sometimes they get uh, more weight in, to be selected. Or uh, there are some other platforms which are very good in mobile or, or, or in specifically to co be compliant with one uh, regulation. So I, I will say uh, maybe uh, I definitely confirm that uh, uh, you can, uh, most of the platforms, all, all, most of the platforms can, you can build the solutions in any of these platforms. Uh, but it will depend on basically maybe in the use case in order to identify which one is the best for yep. your. Uh, Great. And, we'll, we'll and let me go ahead and piggyback off that on I've been with organizations that kind of been bought by other organizations and had the three platforms. And ultimately, at the end of the day, I think that, you know, when we're talking about dupl duplicative systems, um, at the end of the day, you want the one that's going to be the best for your organization. And I think that, you know, eventually you're going to have to get rid of one of the others um, so that you don't have those three different systems that people are having to use, utilize. So I think eventually you're going to have to pick one and standardize them across the organization just to have the, you know, one that everyone can utilize so that you're not having to spend a ton for three different licenses. Yeah. And you and can the use data, the data distributed data is a tough one because if you can picture an agent, if anything, that's a use case we want to take in consideration that agent that's at their desk pivoting between system to system to get the full picture of, of solving whatever record, whether it's in grants management, case management, service management, whatever it is. Um, the ultimate goal is that there's less touch points for that agent solving an issue. And um, that would be more of the reason to have that roadmap of the application rationalization, get rid of what's duplicative as we've all been talking about and, um, and figure out what is the best for that automated one-stop shop of information. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you can yeah. use this this these topics these evaluation points in order to do your comparison between your three, any of the platforms that you have in order to see which one is the best fit for you, and 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 if one of them and I can see here right now, Chris, that uh, you had mentioned that there are some proprietary data. One of the main characteristics of the local development platforms is the flexibility. If you are getting tied to some restrictions about, okay, you are not able to consume this data, et cetera, I will say that that is a disadvantage for that platform. And, and I will say that mo most of the time, uh, this platform should be able to, to connect uh, no matter what type of uh, system, if it's a legacy, if it's a proprietary, a commercial software, or even if it's a, a between app, uh, sorry, between um, uh, uh, platforms, they, they, they should be able to interact with data, you know, to interact with the data. Use. Yeah, there should be no problem like getting that data from one to another. Exactly. I would like to summarize this conversation. Ultimately, you would want to choose one because the way these platforms now, they try to incorporate other, like whenever, even if they have some deficiencies, they would try to include that functionality in, in their platform. Uh, and it's like, think about it as 
these platforms are pieces of Lego and each Lego piece brings you functionality. It's just a matter of some platforms have some Lego pieces which are stronger than others, but ultimately you would want to have one unified platform that allow you this enablement and not struggle to have multiple ones inside your organization. Yeah, I totally agree in that point, Dries, because uh, one of the also the one of the reasons that you should go for a low uh, a platform like for low code is to try to create these shared components. You know that it will help you to accelerate the delivery for any other uh, for future projects. Exactly. And that that will happen through having a consolidated a, a unique I mean a unified platform. You know, instead of creating components for different platforms. Yep, agreed. Great. And Howard, thank you for your patience and your getting your answer and um, asking the question again. So we will make sure that we cover that question in our first round at the end. We'll try to get through the slides first and we'll all just keep an eyeball on the time so we can have about five minutes for the end for Howard's question and any other ones we have time for. Well, let's quickly move okay. to the next slide. Thank you everyone for your, your good info sharing there. This is our fun slide. I cannot take credit for making this picture when I get to talk about it. So I, I win there. So thank you for the author of this slide. Um, this is a great picture of our four use cases we're talking to about today and where they all fit, all centered around low code development. So it's all about the balance as one can see. Yin and yang of too much power or too much complexity are not sustainable. You gotta keep them in check. And we're centering that around low code development in our discussion today. Um, to seamlessly incorporate these capabilities um, is really a topic for 2021 in general. It's the constant move to being able to allow people to work remotely, have a single source of data, and get rid of things that are just really kind of deemed as either legacy in their code configuration, the complexity and upgrades, and so on. So we're going to cover four topics today, low code development, workflow with tied to robotics processing automation, which all stages that user experience to really allow the capabilities of intellectual artificial intelligence, the AI component, and the machine learning component to really give you those benefits. So we're gonna do this as long as the robots don't take over. So that is the key. And Driss is gonna guide us through all of that in a couple of slides from now. So all of this provides your IT specialist a better way to work and your end user more satisfied with the results and the product. So I'd like to ask right now if we have anyone out there with a relatable experience that they could share in trying to find that balance of just planning work with um, low code development and then with RPA. Do we have um, any good just like tidbits on um, something that worked well or something that you wish you wouldn't have taken the endeavor in? We can take the answer either way. Okay, for the sake of time, we'll just move on then, because the nice thing is we're going to get to introduce more, informa more information sharing with our practice leads, and we'll kick it off with Anhil talking um, primarily about low-code development. He is um, our Center of Excellence Lead for Appian Practice, and we're thrilled to have him on today talking about his client work and his vision for what he's been doing with um, low-code development. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, low-code is really is a topic that uh, right now you can... Uh, read everywhere, you know, and Forrester, Gardner, they are talking about the, the low code and they have a, uh, there is a, 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 a forecast that the low code, it will be, it will be growing in the next five years. Uh, and why is this? Basically it's because uh, right now there is an increased demand in the organization in order to create IT solutions. And this solution needs to be created faster, needs to be created uh, flexible in order to adapt to changes. And, and react to the external uh, variables in, in, in the in this uh, and make it uh, in, in the, um, the in the organization as well. So, uh, what kind of things you need to to make sure to have uh, as part of the low code development platforms? And I think this is part of coming coming from the Chris. Uh, it was pointed out, right? Having duplicated uh, uh, systems or, or trying to optimize the resources that they already have, or even uh, uh, try to 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 reduce the support, you know, and, and uh, because it, that makes agile the, uh, the organization. So the essential things that uh, the local development platform you should have is basically to be able to create a faster uh, uh, UIs, you know, using drag and drop or, or, or type of 
create workflows in using drag and drop and configuration, most likely configurations and very minimal code involved there. Um, also, the, this, this platform should have uh, already created widgets for tables, graph, buttons, maps, and all these it will be just drag and drop in order to be reused. And uh, and it will create, you can, uh, this, this platform also allows you to do uh, or to create pre-built user interfaces templates that it can later be used. Let's say, for example, if you are asking for a customer information, you don't need to create that again. Again, you maybe you can create your specific component that it will be for uh, for customer information that you can reuse it in all your your all your applications or the solutions. So all all this functionality is the essential part is basically to provide the tools to make you agile and make it uh, to create applications faster, right? And, the, and from the auxiliary perspective, I think, we, well, we this platform also should have tools that it will help you to monitor and keep tra uh, tracking of uh, every single transaction that is happening in the platform. And uh, you should be able to to see the details about how the, you, how the, the user uh, uh, navigate across the application and see details about the data that it was input, how the data was got transformed, how the data got stored in the database, and if there was any issue, it will immediately identify it. So these tools it will be part of the it needs to have part of part of the platform and provide you to do flexibility in the integration part. You know, having adapters already the, the platform now they, they should have adapters for the major uh, commercial CRM, Salesforce, ERPs like an SIP or, or or, or Oracle, and these com these adapters, so they, uh, uh, it should be uh, flexible to use. I mean, uh, you don't need to develop; even most likely will be more as a configuration, you know. And and created integrations nowadays uh, is simpler and simpler. But it's important to mention that uh, even if you in a low code development platform, you can create very complex integrations. You need to focus in what is important, you know, and. Uh, uh, or use it for what is important. Low code is more for UI perspective or more for the user interaction. Um, whenever you are talking about integration with high volume of data, uh, you need to be uh, careful about that because even if you can do that, that's something that you, we have seen that from the performance perspective is not the best option. Uh, reusability compo models, we talk about that, right? I mean, uh, uh, whenever you sh in this platform, you should allow to be to create these reusable components that it will accelerate your, uh, your delivery. For example, I, I say uh, customer information, right? Maybe address validation where you can uh, create a component that it will validate all the addresses and it will maybe suggest some address and you don't need to rebuild that again, again, you know, and and that that kind of thing. It should be allow uh, the platform should allow to support. It should support the component-based architecture. Um, uh, also, nowadays uh, the deployment is part of the uh, uh, the complete deliver deliver process deliver process. So for that, we need to uh, these platforms contain or supports continuous integration, continuous development. And uh, that type of uh, pipelines it can be configured easily in these type of platforms. So you can have the end-to-end -end software development process or software development lifecycle to be implemented as part of the as part of uh, a pipeline for the uh, quick deployment. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So uh, yeah, is there any question? No. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, I will pause here. Uh, uh, is there any question about uh, what uh, what should a local development platform should contain? Uh, what type of challenge uh, are you facing right now with your platforms at this moment? No? Uh, I, I want, something that I want to, to mention, uh, I want to point out is, uh, uh, we need to be careful on the low code development, uh, platforms because as this is a shared development place, we need to keep governance over it. So it's important for you to establish best practices uh, uh, process in order to make sure that you are not going to affect others. Or sometimes you create this application so fast that sometimes you can uh, make obvious some of the bad designs, you know, in the in the application. So. Low code development platform doesn't mean no code. It means that you need to do the code, but in uh, in such way that you don't affect others. Okay, it's something that to point, point yeah, out. Yeah, good point. That review board aspect doesn't go away as much as we modernize. Just the the come together, collaborate on and sign off 
and what's getting implemented. And then the reusable components piece, that's huge because as you said, you could have parallel work happening and then you'd want to refine it to a common set of reusable components. Yep. Yeah. Great, thank you. For the sake of time, I think we'll move on to the next slide. So if there's any other uh, development questions, low code development questions, please bring them up. It all kind of ties together to what Driss, our PEGA expert, cloud services expert, is going to talk through next about a little bit more about those robots and how to control them. So Driss, take it away. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you, Leanne, and thank you, Angel. So hi, everyone. I'm Driss Alami. Um, just a little bit about me. I'm Digital Transformation Lead and currently a subject matter expert in the federal space and yeah, at the IRS. So without overdue, I will go ahead and shed the light on our second use case, RPA with a case management. And as I mentioned earlier, and what Angel has described is the low-code platform. And some of these low-code platforms come with RPA as one of their tool set that you could leverage inside your organization. So it's no wonder that robotics process automation market is getting a lot of hype being named by Gardner as the fastest growing segment uh, in the global enterprise software market. Enterprises have real legacy system needs and who wouldn't want to avoid performing mindless routine tasks? So RPA, when used correctly, provides relief from tedious tasks and redirects employees to higher value work. So we know there's a lot of questions out there about robotics process automation. We know whether you are starting your journey or you have already implemented RPA, there are so many use cases out there and there are a lot of vendors to choose from. So what, do we, what we want to do today is to share some use cases of RPA and hopefully along the way, answer some questions that you might have. So in this story, I also would like to share with you a recent project that um, Sky Solution have led in the grants management space where we were faced by two major challenges. The first one uh, is about legacy systems. So we were restrained by legacy systems and those systems created data silos, lacked the APIs for integration and required heavy coding to make any change. So as a result of that, we had two major issues to resolve the data silos and the lack of integration. And given that legacy system won't be replaced overnight, we needed to find a way how to bring the legacy systems into the transformation until they are upgraded or replaced. The second challenge we had is that the case workers struggled to navigate their hodgepodge of disconnected desktop applications whenever they engaged with constituents. Um, distracted case workers wasted a lot of time toggling between dozens of applications to input and review data, frustrating both them and their constituents and causing data inconsistencies. I think a lot of us in the audience today can relate to some of these challenges in their own organization, but the, really the question that imposes itself now, how did Sky Solution leverage RPA to remediate these challenges? So as a solution, if you don't mind clicking, perfect. So for the legacy system challenge, we leverage the robots to pull data, um, to pull data from systems that do not have APIs or some system did have it, but they were locked. So having that solution of being able to go bring the data we need without having APIs was a huge time saver and something that we were able to take uh, benefit from right off the bat. So we used RPA to bridge legacy systems and eliminate repetitive manual data uh, input from the team's biggest time thief, which is updating customer information in the systems of record. The second challenge uh, for uh, the overwhelmed workforce we found RPA was very helpful in automating tasks that were repetitive, high volume and long running. For the most part, we used RPA to automate tasks and processes that were rules driven. Uh, the case workers were not anymore stuck in endless copy and paste cycles and enabled them to deliver customers the outcomes they need faster with greater accuracy. Because if you have a bot doing for you the copy and paste, it is, you take it from point A to point B. And if you're just relying on your caseworker to do it, that is 
prone to sometimes make an error and paste it in the wrong field and then create more and um, underlying impact on the data and the accuracy of it. And I would like to draw attention, uh, your attention to this point particularly, because we didn't apply RPA to processes that only can be automated 100%. We looked at processes that could be automated at 20%, 30%, where a robot can be assisting a human and be his virtual assistant. With the attended approach of RPA, we were able to deploy a robot to every production worker desktop that is where we got the most return on investment. Uh, let's say the example, if you have 100 case workers in a division inside your organization and you were able to automate using bots only 20% of their work, that's 20 FTEs that you have freed their time to move uh, to higher value work and could be uh, helping with other efficiencies inside your organization. Now, all these solutions sound great, but what is the word of caution here? And how can I implement RPA successfully and leverage it to its full potential inside my organization? A lot of, a lot of enterprises in the rush to uncover the possibilities of RPA, they are hitting roadblocks along the way. Either the RPA projects fail or do not meet the scale they need. And in order to take full advantage of your RPA, we highly recommend leveraging a combination of your attended and unattended robots, meaning that you have assistant to your humans doing the work and not just waiting to do those automation that could be running behind the scene at 100%. And that's delay your process and delay your return on investment. So start your journey with attended RPA, driving that initial ROI. Do not focus only on processes that could be automated at 100%. Automate the 10%, the 20 You can then look at processes that could be automated via unattended RPA and could be running behind the scene while you have your workforce uh, waiting. And from there, look forward to intelligent automation where um, Joe will touch upon uh, that in the next uh, use case. So get quick wins by automating the employee as well, desktop. For instance, this is very time consuming for case workers that need to interact, let's say, with five legacy applications. And just having this bot that you just click on a button and opens all these applications that he needs to interact with, even if it's a 15 minutes time saver in the beginning of the day, accounted for all those customer service representative or all those case workers working. That's a huge time saver. We do neglect it, but sometimes for me, you open the VPN, you open all this application, imagine you just have a one button and opens all those for you in the right screens you need it. And last, get off the mindset to revert, uh, revert into training people to do the work that robots can do more efficiently. I would like now to, now that we went through the challenges, solutions, and considerations for RPA within case management, my colleague Joey will showcase another uh, use case where RPA and AI, aka the brain and the brown, can work to together to deliver value to the customer service industry. Take it from there, Joey. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. My name is Joey Pino. I'm the Service Now Practice Lead at Sky Solutions, and I am going to be talking about conversational AI with customer service. So with the introduction of this thing called COVID-19, I'm sure a lot of us have been calling in to get assistance with things. And we've been getting a message that says, due to increased call volume, your wait time will be longer than normal. Um, it's been the thing that I've been getting a lot when I've been calling in to customer service for IT, customer service for my bank, things like that. And based on that, you know, it's frustrating. Um, you know, we're getting longer than normal wait times, queues backed up. And because of this, CSAT scores for our customer service are plummeting due to frustrated customers. I think it's a challenge that a lot of us have endured due to, you know, our customers needing help, not wanting to call into a service desk, and basically wanting to utilize self-service features. Um, in today's cultures, we basically are living in remote work environments and we need immediate help. And we don't want to wait on the phone for 10, 15, 25 minutes, maybe even up to an hour. Um, 
So we need ways to limit volumes, uh, have our agents available to help and get our customers taken care of quickly and efficiently. And that's where, you know, we've come up with chatbots that can help. Basically a chatbot is a software application that uses AI and natural language to help understand what we want and guides us to a desired outcome with a little, as little work as possible. And you may have seen these on a website when you go to it. There are little icons in the corner that you click on, kind of tap, type what you're looking for, and it takes you to a knowledge base article, it takes you to a live agent. Um, they can be role-based, AI-based, or live agent-based, depending on how you configure them with your platform. Um, they can be built to answer questions, direct users to knowledge bases, um, even perform password resets. They can do more than that as needed. Um, it's based on how you build them. Um, and it's one of those things that you can, you know, basically build an engagement with your customer with that, you know, can have a personality. Um, great chat box, bots or virtual customer assistants learn from past conversations. So let's say that I came to the queue yesterday, had an interaction with the chat bot, and I come back today, they'll know that I had been there yesterday and say, hey, you were here yesterday. Um, is it for the same issue? And they shouldn't just talk. They should engage with the customer in the way that they naturally speak or write. So if I come in and I'm speaking in a foreign language, they should know this and speak to me in that same language. Um, one of the things that you know, ServiceNow, Pega both have done is they offer that chatbot functionality um, to help with these business challenges. ServiceNow calls theirs a virtual agent. Pega uses a chatbot, doesn't necessarily have a name. But, um, you know, the platform configurations can be used, um, you know, for answering FAQs, platform tutorials, basically like a how-to, um, querying and updating records, gathering data for the live agent, performing diagnostics, revolving, resolving multi-step problems, and so much more than that. And it's just one of those things that, you know, with us going into the self-service era, um, it's definitely helped us improve wait times, helped us improve our CSAT scores. And it's definitely the brains behind, you know, the AI robotic uh, steps that Driss was talking about. So, you know, it's just one of those things that we can use going forward to help minimize those wait times and help improve, you know, our customer experience. So that's basically chatbots chat in a nutshell. So now that I'm done talking about chatbots, um, anyone have any questions? No, Joey, I think your example we've all experienced, and it's nice, like Verizon for one, I've been on there frequently and I've seen where I've left off with virtual agent messages. So that's good because it also can escalate priority for a real agent if, you're, if the recurring unresolved issue is still part of the chat. It does certainly lead to customer satisfaction, and that's what we're all about as well, to ensure that the user experience is improved based on these technologies. Definitely. Yep. And with that, I'll move to our last topic and let Angel kind of round out the discussion about now that we have all this data, we have all the prep work with virtual agent content, analyzing that in a business model, modeling approach is really the essence of machine learning. And then what we can have as predictive resolution to make things better for the agent and the end user. So if you could take it away and round out the discussion there, we'll spend a few minutes here, turn it back to Mike to close out the, the day. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Leanne. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we have talked about low code, right? And we have talked about the, uh, how uh, these uh, RPA tools and the chatbots can provide very uh, innovative solutions. Uh, but uh, nowadays, uh, there is a huge uh, interest in order to automate, you know, apply automation in whatever is most possible, right? And in order to make sure that um, uh, uh, to reduce the number of errors or even, uh, you know, having a digital worker is sometimes is cheaper to have because we are really expensive, right? I mean, as a human. So, uh, so that's why it's important for, for uh, to start looking on the uh, machine learning and AI, where it can be used. Basically, uh, what we have seen uh, as per our experience is, is to uh, where uh, there is a decision making process and, and that decision making has been implemented or has been there and been done by humans for a long time. 
And we need to, uh, we can automate that decision making process, taking advantage of the history data, whatever data the, 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 where we can take uh, all the variables that were applied in order to take the decision. We can train models uh, using the, the, either creating our own model using uh, libraries like a TensorFlow or, or, or create using the cloud solutions in order to, to have those models public in the, in the cloud, right? And, or there is other section that is having more attraction right now, which is uh, cloud uh, services now provides uh, machine learning models that are already trained. Um, Google Cloud is one example of them where you can maybe do translations, you know, and uh, for example, one of the examples is we, uh, uh, we use uh, Google Translate in order to convert the UIs in different languages, you know, having different uh, drop, drop downs and that. And that conversion is not specifically tied to, uh, 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 to labels. Basically the label is converted on the fly, you know, through API calls. Uh, there are other, other uh, areas, for example, right now, where uh, there is a solution for intelligent document processing where uh, you can uh, see uh, more of, uh, 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 this uh, document classification process. It can be uh, implemented using some of the, for example, Google Cloud natural language processing, where uh, using this integration with a workflow uh, uh, in application, you can uh, have a very strong application already as a, as a component where uh, you can uh, upload a PDF. The PDF will be uploaded into the Google Cloud. Google Cloud is going to taking these models, it will tell you what type of document is this. You can decide then uh, decide to extract the information, meaningful information about, for example, companies that are related to the document and or any person involved. And, and sometimes it can give it, give, give it to you in, in rich data, you know, like a, if you are talking about like, a, this is an invoice and the invoice is coming from the company A, okay, and this is the, day, the balance from the company A, you know. Or, or that type of services can be combined and created in combination as, uh, with the uh, uh, machine learning, you know. Um, uh, uh, and, and the other thing is, is nowadays, uh, the machine learning is being used most likely whenever we, there is a huge amount of data. We, we need to uh, be able to, uh, um, to, to process a um, huge um, uh, vast amount of data that the humans are not able to, to do. Uh, one example is fraud detection. Nowadays, uh, whenever you do a transaction that you normally don't used to do, uh, you will receive an alert, right? So that alert is coming from a, a model that it says, okay, person X normally doesn't, uh, is, is, is doing some devi deviation from whatever they're used to. So let's alert them about this transaction in order to, to to avoid uh, situations of fraud. So those those places are where is be, are being used and it's not for every single case, but uh, we have seen a huge amount of uh, automation that is being done through machine learning and AI in combination with local development platforms and RPA. Yep. Um, yeah, thank you, Angel. Mike, do you want to kind of take it from there? Is there any other questions? Absolutely. If we, if we can go ahead to, to the next slide, we'll, we'll start to, to wrap things up here. You know, originally we had planned to maybe go through an example of this where we take an actual real use case and run everybody here through the very um, thorough methodology that we have for creating an analysis alternative. But that in and of itself could be an entire one hour discussion. Uh, we wanted to bring it up, though, because uh, for all the folks online, you can see there's so many things happening, so many questions, so many moving parts, what's going on out there. Um, these are things that we can help with, even just as a courtesy, if there's folks online that want to talk for 30 minutes or an hour, we're having conversations like that all the time. Uh, I'm, I'm, I actually, have, I'm thinking of one right now, just a few weeks ago, with a very large federal agency, we were on the line with the Director of Acquisition and Grants Management, a Chief Grants uh, Management Officer, and they said point blank, we have been tasked with modernizing around the grants management process. Where do we do, where do we start? Our workforce spends most of its time managing the process. It's very difficult to get visibility into the data. Almost everything that, that we do now is manual. Um, uh, the current system, it's not easy to customize. The workforce is working with all this antiquated technology. Um, what do we do, where do we go? And so they are currently going through an analysis of alternatives, um, not with us, but 
this is just an example of these conversations that are coming up more and more often where we have to fix this thing, this process. We know there's all these incredible functionalities out there, but there's also all these platforms and tools. Where do we go? What do we do? Um, certainly, we're happy to share whatever insight we can, being that we're agnostic to all these platforms, yet we have a, a lot of insight into all of them. So um, for anybody out there that's interested in talking more about that, um, just wanted to put that out there and, um, and certainly let you know. Um, if we want to go on to kind of the conclusion slide, we can start to wrap things up. And, you know, I, just, I thought of one, I read this article yesterday that said, um, it said in the next five years, more applications will be created than in the last 40 years. And it just kind of blew my mind. And it was actually something that was brought up. I was in a, a, a presentation just before this with Appian where the CEO was talking and um, just the, 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 the landscape of, of, of applications is changing so quickly and so dynamically along with, with business needs. Um, you know, this, the, the, the opportunity for low code platforms and business process platforms to, to really make a difference and to start to, uh, to work alongside traditional legacy development, I, I think is such a huge deal. It's this revolution. It's really exciting and interesting. And um, it's something we're, we're certainly uh, on top of and passionate about. So um, with that, um, I know we had a couple of questions that came up. A lot of those kind of got answered real time. Um, I know we have just a few minutes left. I don't know if there's any final questions. Um, certainly, we want to address those, and um, anything we don't address, we can address um, after the uh, after the event. Yeah, for the sake of capturing on audio, if um, that last question, yeah, that's great to go to the last slide. That'd be great to hear um, a recap of um, at least the one about the um, an agency with multiple platforms and what we do about it, and how how we would help pri prioritize that rationalization of all the work on across systems. Um, would someone like to recap that one as we close out today? Sorry, uh, Joe, you're uh, <laughs> he's on mute. <laughs> well, yeah, as soon as I started talking, it threw me on mute. Um, yeah, basically, um, in regards to the multiple systems or platforms, um, so in regards to that, typically when an organization has multiple platforms, what you want to do is understand, you know, which platform is going to bring the most value, value to the organization. And then at that point, you need to understand, you know, from a cost perspective, the licensing, which, which is going to give you the best licensing value. Um, and then from there, you know, start understanding, you know, uh, set a plan in place as far as the data migration and migrating from those other two legacy systems into the new platform. Um, I've been in organizations where they've done this in the past, and it's, it's, it's a process, um, especially when you're doing it globally. You're going to have to, you know, start migrating from like one, one, you know, domain to another um, and then move from one country to another and things like that. And it takes time. But, you know, typically they usually go with the platform that's being utilized most throughout the organization. And then, you know, they'll start moving everyone else, you know, over for, to that platform. So it's a process, but typically that's the way that it goes. Thank you, Joey. Yeah, no problem. Mike speaking. I think he's saying if there's any other questions, then please ask them now. Oh, I got, I got, I got hit with <laughs> right. the new thing. I kind of a fun game now. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, I was going to say, I think we're at the end here. Um, uh, great session, tons of great information. Um, we're really glad everybody joined. Uh, obviously, this is an ongoing discussion. Um, we're, we, we're coming out of a, a year of incredible challenges, but usually that spurs so many incredible new ideas and solutions and thoughts. So um, looking forward to uh, continuing to engage with everybody just in terms of uh, our, our common goals and end games here. So thank you so much. We'll send out a copy of this uh, meeting and um, would love to uh, uh, help out in any way we can in the, uh, in the months and weeks ahead. So thank you so much. Thank and Chris, you. you'll get additional invitations. Uh, just look for us on LinkedIn and we'll always be posting invitations for additional webinars going forward. Absolutely. And certainly, we're doing one more this winter. We really had a fun goal of just getting through the winter together with these kind of uh -huh. topic conversations. So we're working on our last installment for probably in February, early March. You can watch for that. And if you have any things you'd like us to explore, they can definitely go on the short list. We're going to be getting that all together in the next few weeks. So we look forward to you coming back for our next one. Yep. Thank you. Yo, thanks, thanks, everyone. Thanks.